welcome you to the second just practice lecture series. We initiated the series in April 2021 with the intention of bringing researchers and the research aspects of the arts to focus. And through this exercise of inviting scholars, curators, artists, publishers, and creative practitioners to expound and reflect on their research methodologies and practices, we're delving into a very simple but important question of what is research now? And how does it shape our worldview? And how each one of us processes research uniquely to produce something meaningful and our own readings of the world around us. I would conceptualized and moderated the first segment, which I'm calling the first relay of four lectures by Hamad Nasar, uh, Nida Gauss, Saira Ansari, and Grant Watson. There's were the practices, there's are the practices that I'm very interested in engaging with and learning from, as in how their inquiries have grown to arrive at the inventive formats uh, in which they disseminate and process their curatorial and research intensive projects, ideas, and networks. And uh, one of the common thread connecting them was their research-based uh, exhibitions, which resonate with my work as well. So these lectures and conversations are available on the KNMA YouTube channel, uh, which you can access at your own pace if you're interested. And an important realization that I had um, in, during those past sessions was about how subjective research and searching into something is. Subjectivity plays an important role, which makes the journeys of researchers tied to their life and practice a very crucial aspect to be seen alongside the subject of research. So in this series, we are trying to see both together, the subject of research as well as the researcher. And thus the element of the personal is paramount and uh, hence this, the format, the unique format of this series as well. So for the second relay, uh, we've invited Annapurna Garimela to conceptualize and invite another set of speakers and practices that she's personally interested in engaging with. And that's how we arrive at her proposition of crafting thought, which she will uh, elaborate upon uh, later in a minute. And very, very excited to see how it will unfold today and uh, today being the first session and in our forthcoming six sessions. Anupurna is a very special uh, and inspiring person uh, who has mentored many scholars, curators and researchers over the years. And I have learned immensely from uh, each of my interactions with her. And what draws me to her writing and thinking process is the degree of detailing. You know, she's interested in detailing, zooming in and holding things for a while. And this gentler, time intensive process of research is extremely enriching. And with this, I invite you also to invite you and your time, you know, to bring your questions and doubt to us and join us in this journey of research as practice. Uh, for those who may not know Anupurna, she's an art historian and designer who researches medieval Indic architecture and visual and built cultures in India after independence. She heads arts, resource and teaching, ART, a research library dedicated to projects teaching in the visual built and performing arts. And she also heads Jackfruit Research and Design, which specializes in research and curation for the arts. Her recent curatorial projects include Vernacular in the Contemporary at the Devi Art Foundation in New Delhi, uh, which was a very, very seminal uh, exhibition. Um, mutable Ceramic, another exhibition that she curated was Mutable Ceramic and Clay Art in India since 1947 at the Piramal Museum of Art in 2017, which was equally uh, path-breaking uh, in its research. And Another curatorial project, Barefoot School of Craft in Goa um, at the Serendipity Arts Festival in 2017-18. Her recent books are the co-edited uh, volume uh, titled The Contemporary Hindu Temple, published by Mark. And the upcoming volume includes uh, The Long Arc of South Asian Art in the Honor of Art Historian Vidya Dahaja. Her forthcoming manuscript, which is, in first, which is in preparation, is titled Digesting the Past, the Discourse of Sacralized Architectural Renovation in Southern India. Uh, so with that, over to you, Annapurna, to lead us through this evening. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. We are delighted to have you and Sankalpa with us. 
Uh, thank you so much, um, Akanksha and the Kiran Nadar Museum of Art, uh, and all the uh, people who've been involved in setting this up, and to all the participants as well. My greatest thanks, of course, goes to Sankalpa for being the inaugural lecture uh, in this series of six talks. So Sankalpa is an architect and an academic, and I'm not going to spend too much time introducing him because he's going to introduce his own work, and he's going to do it far better than I will. The way that this is set up is that he will for, uh, present for about 45 minutes, then he and I will have a conversation, and then we will open up our forum to other people for um, engaging both of us uh, or just Sankalpa, whatever people would like to do. If you would like to uh, watch on Zoom, you're right here. If by any chance you need to watch it on other streams, it's also live streaming on YouTube and uh, Facebook, I think. So that's also there. And then if you'd like to raise your hand and ask a question, please do so live. And you're also welcome to post it in the chat and I will read it out and share it with people. We all have fluctuating connectivity. So it's nice to have many options available. Um, so before I invite uh, Sankalpa to participate and begin his lecture, I want to introduce um, this series, this module that I have nested, that I've been invited to nest in this idea of research as practice. So um, the module that I've, I've, I've titled this module Crafting Thought, and I should probably begin by explaining what I mean by this. For the last 20 years, I have been immersed uh, in these following uh, about five, six areas of research, and they're all connected. So let me just go through them and then you'll understand uh, uh, better why the series of lectures is going to unfold in the way it will unfold. So the first is I've been very keenly interested in how um, people design, practitioners design forms that intentionally or consequently transform social experience and consciousness. So I'm really interested in this idea of consciousness and social experience being connected and thought through design and the making of form. A second thing that I'm very interested in and uh, that is materials and how they direct and contain human thought and capability. This is very important to me. So you would understand this if that if we curated this exhibition called Mutable Ceramic and Clay Art in India since 1947, that perhaps it's the first exhibition to ever be solely focused on the medium of clay. And since clay had uh, such a profound uh, meaning as um, a modern material that had was literally the root of the country, the literally, literally the terrain of the country. It was very important to see its histories, its politics, its economics, its creativity, uh, the, the creativity embedded in it over these last 70 years. Another area which I'm really interested in is cultures of innovation and the forms of economic and creative transactions they produce, as well as how the idea of innovation structures artistic prow prowess. And here I use the term artistic in a rather broad way to include the variety of people that are speaking in this series and who beyond this series who engage with this idea of innovation and thinking beyond the conventional ideas that um, a discipline or a practice or a material has um, been bounded in or bounded by. Another area, if you've guessed from the, the, the name of the organization that I founded, Art Resources and Teaching Trust, I'm deeply committed to pedagogy. So for the last 20, uh, it was founded in 2001, so it's 21 years. Uh, for the last 21 years, I've been involved in teaching, in advisory committees, in um, all kinds of informal and formal situations. Informal, I mean, outside of the university and college systems involved in pedagogy. And towards this, 
I've been deeply thinking about how ped pedagogy and how it conceptualizes materiality, design, um, intentionality, and innovation. I'm not so much interested in the word sustainability. You might see that I've distinctly avoided that word. And it's not because I dislike the word, but I'm interested in thinking away from that word quite frequently. I'm an art historian who primarily works with architecture and craft. The people I've chosen for this series of conversations are only known to me through their work. I have only met, actually met one of them and that too very briefly. This series for me presented an opportunity to have again, after two years of solitude, which many of us know we've gone through, deep conversations between strangers, something I love. I love to listen, so it makes me very happy just to listen to people talk about their work and their ideas. I love to understand how people think their way through life, especially in the sphere of work. I have chosen Sankalpa, Shahid Salim, Salim, who will be the next speaker. Uh, he's an architect as well and works uh, on, and a teacher. He's also an academic and an architect. Um, and he works on mosque architecture with a particular kind of deep thought in mosque architecture in Britain. Um, after him in, I'm, is Annapurna Mamiripudi, a uh, science and technology studies scholar who's been deeply involved in theorizing how weavers think and the materiality of, of um, textiles and how this translates further and further and further away as the fabric moves away from the loom into the world after as a finished product. I've also invited David Blamey, um, who was supposed to be our first lecture, but for unforeseen circumstances had to, uh, can, we had to cancel that lecture, but he will be back. Um, and he is a teacher. He was, he's a practicing artist. He taught at the Royal College of Art and he left uh, and started his own art school called the Total Art School. And a fascinating person because he's, he's a polymath. He likes to think of himself as a polymath. Um, he has his own publishing house. Uh, he works collaboratively with many people. Uh, he has spent at least the last 30 or significant periods of time in India and is questioning all the time, what does it mean to practice art? Following David is uh, our Lily Irani and Judy Freider. Lily Irani is a, um, uh, com she comes from a human computer interaction background from Stanford University, and she teaches at UC Irvine. And uh, she, her doctoral work was on cultures of innovation in India. And uh, she spent a lot of time both in Delhi and understanding the history of innovation as it was, as it is designed both in studios as well as in pedagogy and in national policies. Uh, so that's very important. And then she herself designs, she and, and puts her design products, which are computer programs and nests them in this, this um, new world of automization and artificial intelligence that is growing. And um, I thought it was very important. I've been reading her work and I found it utterly fascinating. And finally, there's Judy Freider who has spent a lifetime. She came to India in her early twenties as I think an uh, undergraduate student and she dedicated her life with great joy and um, verve and commitment to working with communities of people on the edge of India uh, and who have a history of inhabiting uh, spaces which are um, on the borders of the nation, both conceptually and uh, economically. And I love her work. Uh, the way that she wrote Threads of, Threads of Identity, her work on their abadis, 
And I wanted to understand what led her to and how she thought about creating artisan schools, artisan designer schools, how she thought about creating artisan designer led museums, and how she has uh, crafted thought her thought about craft. So all of these people are um, people I intend to have deep conversations with, in spite of being new to me as people. They are um, very close to me because I felt drawn and nourished by their work. So I thank all of you to, for joining us today, and I invite Sankalpa to start his lecture. Thank you, Anpurna. It's a great pleasure uh, to be part of this forum. I will share the screen, Akansha, and Let me know if you're able to see my screen. Yes, I'm able to see the, your screen. Okay, so, uh, you know, any work that, that we sort of do is uh, to a large extent either supported or shared by many people. So my academic work is shared by many of the people who have supported me in this process. And similarly, the practice work, a work is being shared by my partners as well as artisans, as well as um, all the architects and designers who have worked in the office. You know, this the topic of uh, today's uh, talk perhaps is uh, believing in materials. Uh, and the moment this word material comes in, uh, this word measuring always comes in. And uh, so I thought that it would be important to bring this issue at the beginning of the talk itself so that I'm not uh, uh, compelled to really feel uh, drawn to explain again and again uh, what measuring could be. I do assume that there are multiple ways to measure it. So for example, in my hand, if you see right now, there are two strips of paper. So you see that uh, right now I have one strip of paper on my left and second strip of paper on my right. Okay, and it's a, it's a basically a Xerox paper. So I will put one of them down and let me show you the other one. Okay, so, um, so my body is trying to hold this paper using my hand and my hand is trying to hold it at its bottommost portion. This material is primarily made out of cellulose. Uh, and when I'm holding it under gravity, it is sort of trying to bend on its own. And therefore it is not standing like this. Because the weight is too less, my body is not experiencing that much effort, but, but certainly some parts of my body is experiencing that there is something there. There is a foreign element there, which I'm trying to move. Uh, now on my right is a scissor, okay, and uh, now what I'll do is I'll start uh, cutting this from the top. So let's say if I have cut a small piece of it, okay, you see that uh, you keep observing that this curvature will start changing. So I'll cut some more pieces. So you see it has become slightly more straighter. What is happening is that there is a change in length, but the cross-sectional area remains same. Because there is a change in length, that much amount of mass is being removed from this strip of paper. So uh, I, if I further cut this, it becomes further straighter. And if I cut a little bit more, it becomes straight. If I cut further from this line, this will remain straight. If I cut anything above it, little bit mass, it will start bending. What it means is that this is a unique point in this strip of paper where on its own with a given mass, 
it is remaining straight any change in the mass results into uh, so results into uh, falling of it or responding uh, to the gravity because of its self weight now i'm now putting the same length of this strip of paper which i had because i told you that there were two strip of paper and now this is falling okay you can see that but this is not falling do you see this what i have done is i just folded it okay and it is it is not sort of bending okay if i fold this it will not bend anyway and if i keep on increasing it and keep on folding it it will still not sag so uh, so what is happening is that uh, that there are multiple ways in which one is able to uh, able to gain stability number 1 by reduction of mass by change in form so the same strip of paper in the way in which that form is changed it gains stability and this strip of paper in the way in which we reduce the mass of it it gains its stability or it remains straight and therefore measure doesn't all the time means that a calculation but there are multiple ways to sort of experience uh, what is measure provided uh, we are clear about the experimental setup within which we are working so what i'm going to show you is all about measuring but we will but i'll be never using this word measure after this slide uh, except then when i'm talking little bit about engineers i, I don't think i'll be uh, at all using this slide now uh, the way in which this presentation has been structured is that uh, it has got phases in my thinking uh, that's what that's what i have put in and the first phase of this is is uh, the school uh, uh, which i thought was uh, was uh, was compelling me to think that do i really own my thought uh, uh, because because in the way in which uh, the training sometimes are so strong uh, and sometimes they are so deep uh, that uh, that all uh, all our life we are struggling to sort of make a sense of it so in the beginning of my life when i was in class 4 i i sort of joined the school and stayed there for seven long years all my teens when i moved out uh, and so uh, you see two different worlds uh, in in sort of when you get in and when you get out uh, the the world is different uh, uh, and this place was uh, basically a, a a place which is run by monks uh, what i remember more or what i survived more in this place was what i have shown you the playground and the and the sports because there were extreme competition uh, people students who were who were sort of my brothers uh, or my friends who were sort of uh, studying with me were very um, capable let me say that way that uh, uh that 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 it was healthy but at the same time it was uh, at that age it was uh, almost like a cutthroat uh, survival that that you are sort of dealing with in that very space uh, but that space has other things to offer as well so in the 90s when we were studying uh, we were we were dealing with uh, many of these questions and these questions were coming because the school itself had uh, had couple of very strong points one that it believed that science was extremely important for this country uh, india and it also believed that its its traditions uh, or let me say its dominant traditions or philosophical traditions were important and very equally scientific and only in sort of coming together of the both would you be able to make what they call it as complete man which is again uh, you know a sort of uh, problematic term in our time we have learned first uh, to be more sensitive to to refrain from using this word man uh, and to become more plural uh, but at the same time uh, there was a very strong emphasis let me say that 
So the brief history of time in 90s was as popular to us as Fritz of Capra book, uh, because in his book, he was trying to sort of uh, relate mysticism of a certain kind to the scientific ideals. And therefore, all the books that were talking about convergence of a certain kind were books that interested uh, sort of many people. You can understand that because science in a way is something that uh, that can that is much more convincing than perhaps all worldviews uh, related to metaphysical inquiries. So, uh, so that was the space which, which we were living in. And we were also living in space where mathematics was very strong in the school. Uh, and, uh, and for whatever reasons, uh, not everybody uh, had the abstract thinking of mathematics. There are multiple ways to think about abstract uh, sort of ideas. Uh, and so it sort of started building up. But at the same time, I also wanted to, to sort of uh, uh, state that, uh, and I have put it here uh, because, because the last, so th this is very common, this Nastya Sukta is very common. If you have, uh, if you have seen in the 90s serial Bharat A Coach, the first part of, of, of that hymn was basically the Nastya Sukta, which comes from the Rig Veda. It is, to me, it is, it is a reconciliation of my uh, uh, of my uh, sort of uh, uh, sometimes moving out, moving in in sort of journey. Because if you look at the last part of it, uh, uh, and please forgive me for this word he, because uh, whatever they sort of was writing there, it sort of says that when all creation had its origin, he whether he fashioned it or or whether he did not. Uh, and it continues to say that that even he doesn't know it. Okay, so if you if you look at the last part, there is a doubt that is created in a tradition which otherwise seems to be very convincing about the idea of of let's say uh, let me use this word Ishwara, not the God, and let me use this word nature or the prakriti. So. Uh, so this was also happening at that time, but but from a, when you're coming from a scientific mind, in your mind, none of these things make sense unless you see that there is a doubt, there is a sense of incompleteness in the very process of inquiring uh, our own life as well as life on this planet. Uh, there were uh, there were phenomenal amount of uh, uh, of impact that they created on us. But I will sort of little bit touch on two of them. Both of them currently are extremely famous monks in their own way. On the right, uh, the person is heading now the Vedanta Society in New York, and uh, his online lectures are extremely famous. Who am I is a lecture which he delivered at IIT, uh, which is uh, one of the most uh, frequented lectures uh, on, on sort of uh, philosophy. And it's fairly clear about the positions that he is taking, but on the left was somebody who was at the principal that time was extremely influential in uh, in a number of ways. But uh, but uh, and currently he is also an author of several books. But I will talk about one thing which I felt was who deeply impacted many of us. Another thing what what he was sort of talking about was this question of root two, and if you look at the root two, root two is an irrational number. So if you if you sort of uh, find the number of it, it goes 1.4142, et cetera, et cetera. It keeps on going. There is no end to it. It is, inf sorry, let me go back. It is infinite, okay? But if you are able to use geometry, then the very system of the knowledge in the numerical, in the algebraic system or, or that system, that what, what makes it infinite, in the system of geometry, it makes it finite. Um, and, and, and that, that uh, you, know, you know, that opening of that, uh, that plural uh, ways of looking at things was extremely important. And I felt that that was very deep. Uh, because it was right in front, it was measurable in one system of inquiry, it was infinite in another system of inquiry, we, we could pin down to say uh, the length of it. Yeah, but, but see all the time, uh, 
this 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 question of relationship between the science and the religion or the metaphysics or the or philosophy uh, continue uh, and 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 they were constantly moving in and out uh, uh, and 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 we were constantly trying to deal with it the second phase uh, um, uh, became important again because uh, i was coming from a landscape uh, which was a flood prone region so this is this is the region from where i am coming which is the north of the ganges uh, our ancestors were farming and they still continue to farm and every year there would be a flooding in, in, in sort of in our area but what was important is that the river kept on changing its course uh, and when river kept on changing its course you will see slight modification in land form because of the nature of the soil that was there uh, uh, river the water had capacity and the force to deal with it with the soil in sort of trying to modify it unlike let's say if the landscape is made out of out of straw out of stone so uh, so this modification of the land and water uh, what it was uh, doing was that um, somehow it it was sort of giving a sense of um, absence of artifacts uh, it was giving a, a sort of a sense of uh, a deep sense of your identity which cannot be put into an artifact uh, but 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 you struggle to look at it as a process because there is not much to talk about it or there is not much at least to show as an evidence unless until one has experienced about it so this is from 1985 to 2000 this uh, this landscape you see the shifting of the ganges uh, and changing its its course uh, where you are doing farming uh, and what it results is these are the two extreme types which is possible even on the right whatever is is there is is the typical of of if you have got much resource that's maximum you can sort of build on and the left is the modest house uh, which you can sort of uh, which you can which you can build which is not uh, not uh, not permanent would not be a good word but let's say the cycles of repair in this case are much quicker as against one on the right uh, in in terms of repair cycle i'm talking about so so at the same time what also started happening was uh, uh, for a, for a major part of the life i don't think i have lived in what i can call a home so most of the time i'm out since uh, since uh, 1988 uh, so uh, so you see this left the same landscape when the ganges has flooded and on the right when there is not flood you can see the ganges at the back okay so uh, so one because of this question of identity the post, the question of home becomes notional uh, because because there is no other artifact to to sort of connect to it and 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 there is this continuous uh, search that that you are sort of trying to undergo at the same time you are witnessing whenever you visit uh, from young to sort of today you cannot deny that uh, that what the landscape was there even in terms of water in terms of the rains the patterns have changed okay now why i am trying to emphasize this because uh, it it gives me great discomfort when somebody says that you know it doesn't change but the fact of the matter is somebody who has lived in it knows that it changes you cannot uh, sort of deny that because because it is right in front of you when i started visiting other landscape one of the landscape which i was drawn to was the landscape of this deccan uh, and this this region of tungabhadra uh, uh, because of the nature of the stone and its relationship to the water uh, because on one hand I, I, on, on in the landscape in which i was sort of born and was a landscape in which the particles were very fine and so hardness and density was very difficult to find and what one would the compaction of the soil uh, was taken care of by the grass that it would grow to sort of hold the soil but in this case the nature of the soil itself allowed it to sort of uh, make it dense because it was dealing with stone 
and it became important because I realized that uh, that the landscape in which I was living was constantly modifying in my own lifetime. But when I look at this landscape and when I see this stone right in front of me, perhaps I may take three, four generations of me to say that there was once in a while a cleavage in the stone because the, because the erosion is sort of uh, less, um, uh, it becomes sort of, it, 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 in your own lifetime, you see certain degree of firmness or constancy in the memory. On one hand, on the left, you see it very, te very temporal. Uh, and therefore, I was drawn to this, to, uh, or let's say, let me say that this contrast in landscape is very fascinating because it brings a very different relationship to the, to the landform and, and, and to the landscape itself. And the other thing what also starts happening is, is that with the water, it, uh, what happens is that based on the cycle of the seasons, uh, things expands and contracts. So there is a there is lot of materials. And when there's a lot of material, there is, there is enough visual density to it and when the water reduces, then, then it sort of starts leaving or it starts discharging the leaves and it starts becoming uh, more, more sort of uh, porous. And therefore this contrast of expansion and contraction, I thought uh, was like, was, you know, like a seed and then the tree. Uh, it is leaving its life, going back. It is leaving its life and going back. Um, this I will have to read a little bit because I'm going into this phase where I'm talking about architecture, the three-dimensional world, making, representing the abstract idea. So these are three, four things which starts happening when we enter into the architectural world. Okay, but there are three points which I wanted to make here. The first is if the purpose of architecture is to build a three-dimensional form. It is the it is the use of models, uh, which is you know objects or models, and other three dimensional tools of realizing the visualization that needs to be brought in in a significant manner in architectural education. What has happened is that the architectural education uh, came from the liberal art to some extent in its early phase, uh, because. Uh, uh, because for whatever historic sort of reasons of its own, and it were influenced by, by, by various kinds of needs. Where if it was Britishers, it was because they needed draftsmen, but it also got influenced by the Baha school of Germany. Uh, and, and, but what happened is that the basic design tradition where we were using a lot of drawings as a tool, somehow uh, uh, when it came to making, uh, uh, the making was difficult and the and to, to, to whatever histor historical reasons could be the dominance of the drawing became very evident in the schools of in the schools and in the education system at large. Uh, then the second point I am trying to make is if the tools of representing an idea is through model, the inception of an architectural idea is a through a three dimensional three dimensional form which increases possibility of directly engaging with a three-dimensional space. Now, if you're, if you're doing a painting, you're using a two-dimensional paper and you're trying to paint it. If you're a sculptor, you are putting it a three-dimensional space, moving around, carving out, etc. And the third is a drawing is a tool of exploring architectural ideas. Its significance can best be explored as an abstraction of three-dimensional form because we are representing a three-dimensional world onto a two-dimensional paper. So it is not real, it is still abstract. So this is what I wanted to put. On the left is Van Gogh painting, okay? It's a canvas. The canvas is made out of a material, it is planar. It uses paint, which is a material. It uses color, which is a material and it uses a brush, it mixes its ingredient, and then it puts that material onto the canvas. Now, I can call it painting, but if I'm calling painting as making, uh, how do you think about it? Okay. The other thing is that, uh, that this painting itself on its, own, on its own is independent. If it is made, it can be put up. 
but on the right is is sort of uh, let's say uh, let's say this image that i have i have sort of put in let's say on the right uh, that image instead of that image if it was it's glenmarker's work if let's say i would have put a drawing of the building would you call the drawing of the building equivalent to work of a painter okay and this this is a very difficult space to sort of be in because because uh, architecture demand uh, you cannot make the full building you can make a furniture mock up you cannot make a building so it also has a pedagogical difficulty because you are dealing with a with a form which is expensive and, and and it occupies space unlike smaller objects which we prototype so unlike the work of a painter how would you look at the work of an architect if it is only about drawing so uh, uh, if you are being trained in a graphical uh, training as as your sort of background uh, versus if you are if you are trained as in in making to me both are important if you ask me uh, but uh, but sometimes in history you are compelled to to strengthen a, a, a part of it which i'll talk which i'll talk later so making also is a form of knowledge like like drawing by giving you a set of drawing you cannot make it in order to make it we need the the knowledge of the uh, of the making which requires much more than ability to just draw it so so making is obviously uh, is, is what we have been uh, or i have been focusing on or i was drawn slowly in my architecture education and i'll show you some of the images i'll not uh, describe all of them uh, but i'll show you some of the image uh, to give you this was uh, this was some words that were given and we were asked to sort of represent it uh so people were making uh, most of them made actually drawings because many of them were extremely good with the drawings but i felt that i was much drawn drawn to look at it uh, like a three dimensional form and i was trying to represent words through three dimensional uh, forms then these are some of the some of the uh, other works uh, where you can see again an attempt to work with models and try and make uh, express architecture and then go back to to sort of try so some of the models of my architecture education uh, you can see this but this was my last sort of work uh, where uh, where the idea of dealing with mass and the idea of dealing with force became much more explicit and this uh, we did with, with a group of students there uh, where we used bamboo and we sort of uh, we are trying to work with uh, thread and bamboo and trying to see that can we uh, sort of hang a bamboo in a way that it appears floating okay uh, so so again early years but we got a sense of weight and we got a sense that if you pull something uh, you would be able to make certain things stand uh phase 4 becomes important again because uh, professor chaya when he was uh, teaching us in urban design he was quite insistent that we need to learn for we need to learn to abstract uh, and these are some of the drawings of my education uh, uh, as part of the urban design where uh, where the idea was uh, of course we were dealing with how does a pure form get structured and modify when you participate it okay uh, and so there were some diagrams that we were sort of trying to trying to work out so you can see some of the uh, representation of of that we were also trying to then work even abstract models so these colors of the streams are not real but they are trying to show different moisture content in 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 the soil or for example uh, again on the left you see an abstract way of sort of drawing uh but trying to communicate that the boundary is extremely important in architecture and 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 when an object comes in it negotiates and eventually fits into where it is supposed to do it and similarly trying to represent part and whole hierarchies uh, or trying to communicate a balance or a dynamic equilibrium between cerebral and and sort of bodily so by that time when i was sort of working there uh 
to some extent uh, uh, this question of uh, of abstract ideas and this question of participation uh, became very strong in my uh, own ways of, of of working the fifth phase is is about uh, apprenticeship uh, so apprenticeship means that uh, uh, my formal apprenticeship has only been with architect Gautam Bhatia. After that, I have never worked with anybody else uh, uh, in my entire career. Uh, then, then, then I have only worked with my fellow uh, uh, co-founders and partners to sort of uh, to sort of deal with uh, architecture making or any or sort of anything. But I did learn a lot from the master craftsmen when I was sort of working in in um, in villages. So, so if you look at Gautam you, and if you look at the right building, this was one building which I could find uh, where I was sort of working. You see the way the geometries collide together, the, the way the circle has been sort of put in the plan and then deals with otherwise an orthogonal form. And if you look at the right side, the you can see the difficulty of that circle coming out of the roof and trying to deal with an orthogonal form in relationship to the circular form. But he was a great influence because one that he, he gave me books to read and also for, for maybe 24 or 28 weeks, the only thing I was doing in his office was he would sketch and his hand was so precise that he would, he would, he would freehand sketch with only a triangle scale. His dimension were absolutely precise I would just take it, put my own tracing and draft it further to make it fine. So all what I was doing in his office was tracing his drawings. And that I did for four or five was, uh, months. And that was the, that is what uh, is the formal apprenticeship that, that I have ever done with, with anybody. So you can see in my final year projects, his influence in terms of trying to deal with orthogonality, trying to deal with, with sort of circles. Um, of course, uh, uh, he himself worked with uh, Anand Raje and 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 sort of uh, on on I am. Uh, so he would have some influence, which I am not, which I have not at least formally asked him. But you can see some of the articulations of that. The other thing what happens is that in his materiality, he would go from materials which are heavier to represent lighter. And that, that generally is an attitude that, that I've seen continues. So from stone to, to brick or brick plaster, and then either to timber or steel. Or if you're using continuous from stone to brick, then once you go above, it becomes more porous as a form. So response to sky, response to ground, uh, heaviness, lightness. So all of these, uh, you know, somehow I find was, was extremely, uh, strong in, in his work. The thing which, uh, which again become important was one on the left, you see Trivanji Mistri from, he is from Bihar. Uh, I learned bamboo, uh, working with bamboo from him actually, uh, when I was working in, in, in the flood affected area. And on the right is Professor Vasavda from which I learned the, the modeling techniques. So what I showed you the paper strip what he will do is he will give you a strip of paper and ask you to stiffen it so that it can span. So one way to span freely is to, is to sort of fold it and let it span. That opened my eyes uh, from a pedagogy point of view because I was struggling, um, uh, I was struggling very hard to find some measurable way to deal, uh, to go about it because it was very difficult to deal from my point of view to deal with abstract idea or immeasurable ideas and trying to communicate. Because, because uh, teaching becomes extremely difficult if, if the methods are not in place, something which is identifiable, something that can be verified is not in place. And I'm extremely grateful that, uh, that, that, the, that he just opened, he gave me a clue about how to go about it. Um, and I also worked with Sandeep Bhai uh, in, in Kutch. Uh, or let's say in Bihar, uh, and, and there sort of I got trained in community working. Uh, and and you, you see on the left, uh, we were, uh, you see Tribhuvanji, you see Tejas, you see other social workers, 
we were working in villages and trying to make uh, houses uh, or trying to support people to make houses and sandeep was extremely instrumental in trying to open up a different way of looking at looking at making and and, and trying to sensitize it otherwise i was coming from i was looking at architecture with a capital a that architecture was supposed to really solve uh, the entire problem and architects were supposed to do it but uh, this this field work was was to me a profound revelation so you see when 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 i went there uh, this was the conditions because of the flood most of the rcc building had sort of fallen uh, we then further or uh, let's say i worked with with other fellow members and documented various building traditions and we came up with this hybrid of of working with some permanent plinth and then using the bamboo of the region and there uh, sort of i learned about if you look at the way they tie it look at the precision with which they this craftsman work uh, it is sort of uh, it, it is very humbling because because what happens is that what we draw on the line uh, on our on our paper the lines that we draw on the paper and when it has to be translated to making that requires a very different attitude uh, and and so it, it it in a way mellows down uh, to to a large extent because uh, drawing is not complete architecture and some of the some of the prototypes that that you, you can see uh, bamboo is extremely difficult material to work with it. Uh, if you would be interested maybe in the discussion i can tell you a little bit about it but it is more difficult than steel it is more difficult than reinforced concrete because we work with all these materials bamboo just gives away very quickly in shear or or it splits very quickly so if we are not disciplined in making uh it becomes very difficult to work with this material because bamboo demands us to adapt to its discipline and it is extremely sensitive to force and to direction which means magnitude is important and direction is important so it it sensitizes us in vector sense which steel doesn't do to a large extent and the other thing is it's it it is easy to experience uh with hand uh, and and sort of work with 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 sort of bamboo with the tools that we have and so some of the works i'll not get into the detail of it but you can see the outcome of some of the works let me go to the second last part of the presentation which is on pedagogy here i'll spend a little bit of time uh um see uh, when we are teaching uh, one of the way to teach is to give case studies so you go and see how people have sort of done a particular kind of a work you go redraw it and learn from it uh, so in that case we are we are either going directly or we are learning through secondary sources and i i i agree that it has a value okay i do not think that there is a, any denial from my side that it doesn't have as a value to it but uh, but uh, the body uh, uh, is an is is to some extent an instrument uh, that is experiencing using five senses uh, and uh, the secondary case studies have limitations because one that it demands an accumulation of previous knowledge and then it asks us to anticipate and learn because it is standing uh, the the other way to learn is to sort of do on, on its own which most of these craft traditions painters artists all of those are a sort of constantly trying and sort of making it the problem with architecture is that uh, we cannot make one is to one building uh but you can on a sheet of paper you can uh, you can make 10 iterations of sbi okay the logo of sbi you can make 10 iteration 200 iterations we cannot do that uh that is one the second thing is uh uh it is important to be sensitized uh, or let us i felt to to weakness rather than to strength 
because because in the process of trying to understand or trying to experience weakness uh, the body gets the body can visualize forces much better okay because uh, because i uh, because it is the force eventually that is making things stand it is the it, so why things are standing because eventually in a building it is coming and resting onto the ground so everything goes into the ground and the ground is able to absorb it it is it is following all the principles of nature and then it is trying to transmit force from the let's say from your roof from what we what we call a span from the span into the wall which is bearing into the ground so what happens is in order to sensitize towards weakness like what i showed you this strip of paper which is flexible the pedagogy is based on flexibility and trying to register flexibility and and what is the rigidity that we get out of relative flexibility so we are not aspiring for rigidity we are aspiring for flexibility and if things has to be strengthened it has to, to be so this has this paper has to be strengthened using a material which is more flexible than this material and not a material which is more rigid than this material because that's where this the body is trying to push itself because it is actually a part of nature the body is embodying nature it is nature itself it 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 may accumulate knowledge or not but the body as an instrument has accumulated knowledge it is using hand it is using all its faculties to try and strengthen this so uh, so to trust the body to be able to act if it is falling lift it if it is falling from this side lift it if it is bending from this side raise it so 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 the, because the because the senses are working it is trying to respond to it okay so body becomes an apparatus which is measuring constantly the forces now that kind of empathy is is sort of required because when we scale it up what happens is that is very difficult to to experience that but at this level when we are trying to use let's say a flexible material like thread the thread gets strength by pulling it it does not get strength by pushing it what it means is that the structure is going to stand when it is being pulled so when we are making a model when we are pulling it it is in tension when it is in tension when it is being pulled the body is experiencing the same force what this object is experiencing okay so there is no difference between the body and this object itself because if there is any slackness in the thread this structure is going to collapse so the sensitization happens at the edge of the failure it does not happen it does not happen in stiffness it does, it happens in flexibility it is like nature it follows the same principles so the when the bamboo bends the fibers somewhere the fibers become dense somewhere it becomes weaker so if the bamboo is bending like this this side is compression and this side is tension because the outer side is being pulled ex and this side is being compressed so the nature in the way in which it will organize fiber it will not be same it appears same it is in dynamic equilibrium to the force when we have to eventually make building stands we have to make it little numb because we add little factor of flex a factor of safety to it but when we are sensitizing ourselves the pedagogy is is about flexibility okay so now what it means is that if we are able to visualize flexibility we are able to visualize how the failures are going to happen and how the forces are going to follow the line of path in a building what it means is that if we are able to visualize force we have a possibility to articulate in a number of ways so on the left is one way to articulate on the right is a different way to articulate on the left is using a rigid material on the right is combination of a rigid and a flexible material so 
what are so we are constantly trying so the configuration remains same but the but the knowledge lies in this depth of visualization of the articulation of force the materials are actually following the line of forces which i'll, I'll sort of talk later okay so what is happening is if you look at kenneth snellson's sculpture or if you look at kurtz's sculpture the compression member the rigid member is floating on the member which is being pulled which is cable here uh, pedagogy requires delay patience and silence so it is not drudgery but but it is a form of drudgery because uh, and and when we were teaching uh, let's say in 2014 when i was teaching there was a sudden 2014 no not 2014 2012 from 2012 in the first year there was suddenly a shift in the batch we saw or let's say i saw that many students had i uh, phones and they were too distracted when we were asking them to make drawings and by that time i had came from the site itself and and sort of quite familiar with making and that is where i realized that we need to change uh the pedagogy into making because silence patience uh is 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 something that helps to embody knowledge uh because see the thing is if there is no body there is no knowledge there is no meaning about it. uh there is no meaning of gratitude for a dead man it is for a living person so similarly so long as the body is there there is an experience it is it is sort of accumulating is so delaying in arriving at an obvious solution is the pedagogy because in the process of delaying to arrive what is a secondary if what somebody has already done it there is a discovery and there is a possibility of new articulation which you will see in students work okay so on the right is tanvi again uh, and she she did it on her own what you can see uh, and you can see the power of making that that it can change and animate and it can it can give a very different sense of bodily confidence um so uh, so obviously uh, uh uh making is also about stability it is about uh, it is about body how it sort of gains its discipline it is about internal calmness uh, and and uh, the other thing what we need to know is the make is that the makers embody stability the artisans embody stability they didn't learn structures if they know it it is if they know engineering it is wonderful but engineering is coming out of number of tests and out of tests the formulas are set those formulas are based on the factors okay so so for example coefficient of expansion let's say l equal to l not plus alpha delta t so it is based on the initial length it is based on the alpha and it is based on change in temperature which means that the length is dependent on these factors it is plus minus fine but they are dependent on these factors so engineers because things has to be predictable measure uh, you one has to do it but the makers embody the knowledge but the problem with that is that unless until you don't make it you do not embody it so the stability is part of it once the maker dies it it is end of it it is non transferable only skill is transferable so in that sense when somebody makes it it is unique we cannot experience the same thing so so the pedagogy also mean is also about that the nature is articulation of line of forces uh and kalpa we have about 5 minutes okay i'll take another uh, i think 10 minutes and i think uh, it should be done okay great okay so uh, so so the last is that uh, that the space and the structure are sort of related because the materials are occupying the structural lines and and then the space is outcome of of this and the space is outcome of the way the materials are organized so structure is waiting for the material to organize and to realize space 
so you see uh, what we are arguing is that the space which is an outcome of organization of material is what architects do but the makers are interested in the space that is occupied by material itself okay and that that argument is there because we think that making is something uh, you know which is um, which is not uh, which is peripheral let me say okay so we never say making is like dancing okay but but we always say so we always uh, see dance in some way but when we are doing making we are also it's also a discipline and we are also making it it is as good as dance okay so uh, that's what i sort of discussed about it and you can see some of the outcomes of that so these are some of the students who are and now um, i'll sort of little bit get into the same pedagogy eventually uh, or let's say this understanding of material and structural force gets translated into into what we are what we are doing right now uh, so this is the team the team keeps on expanding and contracting uh, these are three extremely important uh, people uh, in my own life as far as the architectural journey is concerned they are also co-founder of thumb impressions uh, mano is engineer uh, who is stationed currently in hyderabad and uh, milind and nikhil are stationed in uh, surat so uh, so maybe in discussion we little bit talk about the material uh, like bamboo but uh, but let me talk few things is that bamboo is non standard material uh, you cannot get a uniform cross section out of a project which i'll show you is is a yogshala where we were asked to sort of span a, a sort of already existing building and create it for the performance of yoga so this is the site where we were uh, working uh, it is close to now the declared world heritage site uh, and when we are doing it we are using thread to sort of get the curvature what the gravity gives uh, and then when we were sort of designing it we first made the models um, and you see uh, the outcome of it now the well, how it is based i'll explain you it it has got a member which is in this curve and the member which is reverse and the interpretation was that in yoga you breathe in you wait you breathe out you wait you breathe in you wait there is constant this this change and this balance which is sort of happening so it elevates it sort of expands and it sort of contracts and so we were trying to sort of uh, think about on those terms and therefore articulated uh, members in such a way that the members which were in compression uh, let's say the members which are this curve and the members which are that curve they were mutually dependent on each other if you are interested i can explain you later uh, but that's how the idea sort of emerged uh, and you see uh, the outcome of it it follows the line of force it has got this fish belly and then it is compensated by this arch and when they come together this is what you will see as a section here um, i will take another 5 minutes and purna and then i'm done that's fine so you can see it's uh, in the section how it sort of uh, how how it sort of expands and contracts so it is constantly in this dynamic relationship yeah so so here we are just trying to show that when you are practicing it there is a cone of vision that you are using uh, on the right side is the landscape which it opens and on the right side is this where somebody is trying to train you okay and this is what is the experience of it this we are trying to simulate different times of the day how it will come out this is in its building stage 
and this is what it's uh, finally comes out to be. Currently, of course, it is the largest spanning structure in India in bamboo. It's around 78 feet span, clear span. And you can see from inside. So it's, you're searching constantly to go close to the line of forces. And then you see some of the gestures which has been fabricated, basically water jet cutting and then uh, you have put it as a symbolic representation of the space. This is a small residence again, uh, just I'll quickly run through it. If you look at the way it connects to the ground, you will see that it's a, it's, it's a very clear pattern that you can read it. So whenever we are making it, we are fairly clear about to resolve our own structure before it goes to the structure engineer. Because, uh, because uh, once you do that, then the relationship between space and structure is clean. Uh, it, it has got some degree of hygiene and neatness. It is not. Uh, it is not trying to pop in and out and trying to disrupt space. And so it's a very tight site. Uh, the staircase was the only space that was trying to mediate between uh, between the two. And therefore, uh, we have treated a staircase like a sculpture. So you see on the right, you see the sections. Uh, you see how different spaces are are sort of coming together. What is happening is that one degree of porosity we are getting from the uh, staircase itself. The second, if you look at the right, there is a shadow. So there is a throughout cut. So from the top, the light can come in at the same time, the, the wind can, the breeze, you can take it. And what happens is that allows the movement of, of sort of air in a tighter space. So I'll show you some of the inside. So this is the staircase you see treated like a sculpture. Uh, with steel and then uh, stone above it. And you can see relationship of one space to another. So it's a tiny space. So the more we expand and connect to outside, the more in a tighter space we feel that the space is large enough. Okay, the furniture is also made by us. So one of our wing designs and manufactured furnitures and, is, and the line plaster is also done by our execution team including the interior design. You, if you look at this, now I will sort of uh, explain you. This is again, uh, constantly we are trying to articulate span because to work against gravity is the most difficult thing. And the roofs are the one which is working against the gravity. And so whenever we are sort of trying to do it, generally what we do is we try and see wherever we possible to, to give a sense of lightness by integrating sometimes two material. So here steel and timber is integrated. Timber is integrated to give stiffness in this direction and the steel is integrated to work with the depth of it. So I'll not show full, it is almost near completion. Uh, we'll soon share it. We are also, we also do a couple of exhibition uh, sort of temporary structures, which we did for this raw collaborative in Ahmedabad with workshop Inc. Uh, and uh, this is one of the, I mean, this was the whole stall that was designed. It was prefabricated by us in our factory in Surat and then reassembled on site in the Milona's building. Uh, again, it, it articulates bamboo in a particular way. Uh, some of the installations that, that sort of we have done it. These are artisans who, who worked uh, uh, on these structures. There are more, which is not there in this uh, image. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's see if we can face each other. Uh, would you like to stop sharing the screen? Yeah. And okay. So thank you so much for such a detailed and um, like deeply, deeply um, conceptualized relationship to 
materials that you presented to us and to the construction site and to the process of teaching. So we have about uh, 15 minutes, if not more, a little bit more. So I'd like to ask a few questions um, as part of our conversation. So one question that popped out immediately is, how does one actually relate? How do you, not one, how do you conceptualize the role of abstraction in making? Because you, you mentioned that one of your teachers, I think it was Neil Kantaya, who emphasized abstraction, but abstraction is so difficult yeah. uh, in our education system because um, at one level, it's an engineered kind of abstraction that people are used to dealing with because of the emphasis on technology and on math and on science. But at the same time, abstraction as a fertile, uh, fecund way of sustaining uh, making without constructing a hierarchy between abstraction and making, that's, not, that's very hard to achieve. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. You, I, you understand I, my question? Yeah, so I completely uh, agree with what you said. Uh, abstraction is a struggle. Uh, let me let me sort of uh, put it that way. It's not easy, and somehow deep in our mind, uh, we have been trained in a way that abstraction means a higher level of uh, um, conceptualizing things. Uh, it does in some way. Uh, I am not denying it. It, it, it doesn't. Uh, but. Uh, you are two person at the same time. If you are a maker, uh, conceptualizing or let's say abstraction means ability uh, to clearly visualize the articulation of forces, which is easier. Uh, but when abstraction is about, uh, about, let's say, trying to connect to a narrative, because in architecture, what we generally do is uh, we make a diagram, that diagram extends, gains layer by layer relationships. So, uh, so let's say if there are two people, one person who works only in the day, another person who works only in the night, and, and there are only two hours of meeting between the two, and you have to make a house for them. <laughs> Okay, uh, <laughs> how do you conceptualize that, and how would you create an create an abstraction for uh, sort of uh, sort of for this kind of interaction? And why I'm saying difficulty because if the diagram is about arrow and time, if and and if the diagram is about that intersection of the time is 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 at a particular is 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 time of the day or a night or whatever it is, and it's a space. Because for them, one is alive, one is resting. It's, it's, it's that two different notions which is coming. Uh, so long as it is these lines, etc., it is easier. But now, once you get into how to how do I draw now to put it into that uh, into that diagram that that is the beginning point, what we call as party diagram, which would eventually be made into a building. Uh, that. I mean that 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 is a very difficult one because you are constantly or always I'm constantly trying to have a dialogue or or we are constantly trying to have a dialogue with um, with with the with with these lines okay because what happens is that um, eventually uh, for us abstraction means how are we organizing on a paper the lines and the dots. And, and, and how are these lines and the dot interacting with each other? Um, uh, and, and, what, and, and when we are inhabiting those, those spaces that is made out of these lines and dot, uh, where, is that, where is that space, uh, which is the anchor point for that house to emerge? So for example, that for the tiny house, the staircase is the anchor point. But one diagram is not enough. Uh, it requires more stories uh, to sort of to sort of put into it. Uh, 
but when i'm thinking about from a point of view of uh, of making it and i'm visualizing force it becomes very much clear because you, when you are coming from the making mind because because there are only few ways in which it goes to the ground okay but there are many stories of life uh, so so uh, so i would say that this is a, a great struggle let me put it this is this is a tension where i don't think that i am very much competent to give an answer for it in a very direct term but i am trying to explain the difficulty of of uh, of abstraction in the field of architecture and particularly uh, sort of trying to talk about but otherwise abstraction also means i can make a diagram i can make a table i'm not talking on those terms because they are easier to do uh, well in in a sense abstraction and making something are can be posed against each other if you wanted to construct a hierarchy but they can also be placed on a continuum in order to help you arrive at both the abstraction as well as the the final uh story that crystallizes an abstraction into a form right uh but in that struggle and i'm coming back to this idea of believing in materials uh first i'll focus on belief is the struggle where belief is born or where is where does belief reside as a practitioner how where do you live in that space of belief and where does uh doubt fuel further abstraction and further inquiry and maybe struggle i, I don't see these as problematic things i'm just opening this up to this idea of um the the first dialectic you posed when from your school days between um science and philosophy between uh science and certain kinds of indian philosophy especially very elite philosophies but also were valued so there's a series of dialectics you posed in that from in your lecture and here you distilled it to this process of abstraction uh in fact you actually hold the process of abstraction very dear and tightly in your in your teaching in your process but at the same time it's deeply um committed to the material of bamboo or rope or the body the body is raw material that is also flexible and um succumbs to various kinds of forces tries to manage itself uh and sort of uh cohere in in a variety of forces yeah great question <laughs> <laughs> I mean but I I also think I'm thinking about belief because there's abstraction that gets the job done <laughs> and there's abstraction that leads you to the transcendental yeah so I uh, see uh again uh uh then so so there is a search um which is there but it's difficult to materialize it uh because one it requires communication and communicating internally and using a medium to communicate are sometimes two different things uh because uh because the the thing that is going on in the mind and the method uh and the tools if they sort of come together the coherence of it uh, or the resonance of it appears uh, uh, or it is in that appearance where where you can see that seamless continuity of 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 that which has been uh, which is which is visible now which is perceptible now uh, so long as it is not perceptible to me it is abstract um this this uh this quest this dialectic uh has been very strong it is still strong um and it material is in a way escape to is an escape because it crystallizes it uh because in the absence of crystallize crystallizing it it does not finds the bank uh and and so so when the material so the material is trying to crystallize it but the belief uh is still in this abstract thing 
because it keeps on it keeps on looking at materials to to sort of get into it get in get into it to make it appear uh, and so at that level when we are talking about uh, belief uh, see what happened was that uh, structure became a very direct way to connect because there was no tangible way in which i i can think about expressing because neither i am a storyteller uh, i cannot express too much with words uh, beyond a point i can show things uh, um, uh, the, because the pedagogy is based on speaking less it is not based on speaking more because yeah. speaking more is exhaustion so long as there is a restraint in speaking less the imagination of others also is rich for interpretation mm. so uh, so when the when when the material comes in the structure comes much before before that because it is at that because the structure is abstract Stru structure is abstract it is conceptual it is the material which is perceived it is the material which we are sort of trying to trying to sort of uh, org org organize it so uh, so so to me uh, i stumbled on structure basically so my love for structure is not because of engineering my love for structure is just because it made me survive my internal uh, discomfort or internal it 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 give me reconciliation for this uh, for this dialectics because because there was no other way to express it uh, and it becomes stronger and stronger and i feel that i'm i'm much close to nature when i'm close to that abstract idea of force so uh, and i am much and, and and you are thinking much close to that unity because uh, because eventually uh, the body is uh, you know the the body is what is experiencing it it's, it's difficult to say that um, if we have not made it we don't know it but but in any form if we have made it you will be able to know it uh, it's very difficult to describe it but what happens is that once it reaches one level of of let me say the drudgery of making it elevates so it took very long time in my life uh, let's say or in in let's say my uh, in practice with 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 milind and manu and nikhil and all of them it took a long time of struggle of failure and therefore failures became so important uh, because because the because then you don't look as failure as failure you look failure as sensitization mm. uh, and so it, the moment we look at it we also fully accept failure the belief is to fully live with it it takes time, it, it is it is sometimes stressful because it is a word uh let's say if you are one with your suffering if somebody says that uh it is um it takes long time to understand what does that mean if you have undergone suffering one and another and third and fourth by the time you reach it you realize that only when you embody it the body is calmer the body is not calmer if you are intellectually dealing with it and and so so that's the distinction i'm trying to sort of make uh, make here when i'm trying to say that because it's a it's a process it's a process in time and it sort of uh, it, it it takes time but there is somebody who is living so 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 because you are living you are acting on it. Um, so uh, so um, so there is abstraction there is structure and i'm not saying suffering in a in a way which uh, problematic way but uh, no i actually uh, i i can i can maybe elucidate a little bit on suffering just for uh, the sake of expanding this conversation and, and opening it to other people i think what you mean by su suffering is that sense that you are not the master of something just because you've constructed an abstraction or because you could buy a material or because you could pay for an education or because you can hire people or because of so many other things that in the end you must uh finally really suffer in that sense of not being the thing that you want to be yeah. and the thing that you want to make and you edge towards it and you edge towards and you edge towards it and there's this failure I wonder, I love this idea of sensitize failure as a way of sensitizing you. 
but also um, to repeat what's like, you know, you know, sort of a grandmother's sort of a grandmotherly phrase that, you know, uh, failure is the best uh, teacher or whatever. But I actually think that um, our system of education doesn't encourage us to consider that failure is a deep form of knowledge and that if failure is teaching you nothing but your limitations, nothing but your limitations, then what you're arriving at is a deep flexibility and a, and a deep understanding of how force works in the way that you think and make. Would, would you be comfortable with what I've just said? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it, it, it sort of uh, makes it very clear. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I would like to ask you Susan Bean's question. Thank you, Susan, for joining us today, all the way from uh, Vermont. Um, I found your foray into architecture as making and the embodiment of making processes, processes so insightful. Have you thought about how this perspective can be extended to practices beyond architecture? <laughs> Well, I think I'll think about it because, see, I, I, I mean, nobody had ever asked me this question and I never thought about it because the world revolves around architecture, engineering, civil engineering, structure engineering, and a little bit of plumbing. I mean, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. Our life revolves around, around that. Um, but uh, but uh, this pedagogy, how, I mean, how do you do it? So let me um, just add to Susan's um, question, because as I watched you make presentations, you've incorporated many things into architecture. For example, um, yoga. Uh, I'm not. I'm sure yoga. The ideas that you you were showing with for the yoga shala were not just born at the yoga shala, but they come from deep thinking about. Um, the body is material, bamboo is material, steel is material, a student is material. Everything is in some sense uh, material that you have to work with and to evolve. So you brought in not only yoga, but you brought in the land, you brought in uh, the bamboos, physical properties, material properties. You, you, of course, considered your own education, your own formation. All of these were coming into your conversation about how you teach and think through architecture. Have you ever taken this idea of making uh, processes that you have theorized for architecture to think about other things in life? <laughs> how you cook, how you make choices, um, how you observe a painting, how you observe somebody making a pot. Well, uh, uh, maybe from a pedagogy point of view, I may not be able to answer you, but from a suffering point of view, I will be able to answer you. <laughs> go for it, go for it, go for it. That's the best. Uh, So, see, the thing is, um, what, I'm, what I'm sort of started realizing is looking at people's autobiography, uh, looking at people's life uh, closely, uh, people whom I've been seeing sort of working. Um, there are ups and downs. Uh, some some are more sensitive and they get affected more. Some are able to manage in their own ways. Uh, but what happens is that uh, what I've realized every time there is a failure, uh, the looking at the physical object changes. Uh, the way you start photography changes. The way you use your camera changes. The way you sort of uh, sort of hold now sort of changes. The composition changes um, because uh, because what is happening is every time there is a reconciliation. I am using this word constantly because there is I realize 
there the binaries is is not going to help in 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 the life it has to i mean there are there are histories and past uh, suffering and everything uh, but at, at the end only the coming together and reconciliation is the future it cannot be war it cannot be uh, you know all of these so 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 what happens is that uh, uh, the ex the pedagogical extension yeah, and if i say if i say suffering as a learning uh, if if it is true it will elevate if, if it is true it will it will sort of elevate if there is a deeper inquiry i mean that's what i realized because for me architecture actually saved my life uh, because before that uh, coming from the background in which i i, I was uh, i was actually working for engineering i was trying to prepare for engineering only i stumbled upon it and why when i stumbled upon it i realized oh this was my aptitude because there is nothing like aptitude i ever knew about it and you are going in a totally wrong directions and you are continuously failing for years uh, and 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 sort of what happened is that it happened in my early part of my life an extreme failure of social uh, disapproval humiliation uh, deep uh, deep loss of self esteem uh, and you name things it happens and and, and then you sort of um, see the resilience of the training of you being alone for a long time in your early life makes you survive because because see what you eventually do is that that uh, uh what i say you are in a see you are in a space where you have to survive and uh, for survive you require uh see you require a strength to accept it but to also um, you see you need to wait you you need to wait what i'm saying is you need to have that that patience because that suffering has set up a benchmark of an emotional benchmark for you so 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 when we are trying to teach whether we are, we are teaching history whether we are teaching humanities or any any course or or anything we are doing it the pedagogical extension is to say that you go and see and you come back and when you come back and when you sort of start describing uh, perhaps that's, that's not the best way to describe it and then it opens up rather than to give something right at the one go mm. because the skill is embodied in the knowledge skill is not separate from the knowledge uh, the skill is playing there uh, is is playing right there in the field uh, you do once you do twice we cannot sit in the drawing in the dark room and trying to do all the time because because it requires continuity of practice in all the realm mm. uh, and so you may not be speaking but but you are witnessing it your body is witnessing it you know it um and you are waiting and and you are sort of listening and waiting patiently sometimes listening not speaking too much um uh, is important because um i don't think i can speak too much i don't think i have this ex have this ability to express uh uh beyond some uh, beyond some point but anyway i think this was a very touchy <laughs> um space to get into it so it's now 10 minutes past 7:30 which was the end of our lecture and i want to say a few words before we actually end for the evening sankalpa i cannot thank you enough i don't think we ever i have ever had a moment where in a in a classroom um with or in a conversation such as this where suffering was such an important way to crystallize this abstract experience of learning and making their learning and making are deeply abstract experiences but they are real they're real in the body they're real in the process and um what you talk about waiting is actually a kind of time for digestion yeah. it's a time for digestion it's a time for it to go from being a uh, pure pain or sorrow into something fecund and something that can nourish 
uh, further uh, growth, further making, further work, uh, a whole set of other processes. That's a very honest thing to say. And I'm very grateful to you for sharing this, um, this uh, idea with us. So I thank the audience and I thank all of the staff at the KNMA for holding on to us and this audience that's on Facebook and on YouTube that's watching. Thank you as well. And the next lecture, which is with Shahid Salim, um, will be on March 24th. And he is the architect uh, uh, and um, maker of mosques and thinkers of religiosity, of identity, of how do you hold on to the past in your practice? It's, it's a question. How do you deal with anxiety? So that's that's a, if, if it's, a, it's a very beautiful uh, set of conversations we've been having even before we begin our official conversation on the 24th. So Sankalpa, thank you again. And I wish you all a good night. Yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, wonderful to, to sort of be part of the team. Extremely grateful. Thank you and good night. Good night. <laughs>